Good morning to everyone here and also on Zoom. Happy St. Patrick's Day to those of you who have some of that Irish blood in you. It is a beautiful day outside and it is a blessing for all of us. If you are a visitor, please fill out a pew card and sign our visitor book in the Northex. Please now join me in our call to worship as found in your bulletin. In times of security and insecurity, O oh Lord, Lord, hear our prayers. Confident in your faithfulness. We will ever praise your name. Through the abundance of your steadfast love, you have gathered us into your house. In the, in the holiness, holiness of, of your presence, presence we, we bow down, down to worship, worship and adore you. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 276, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Please stand as you are able in body or spirit. Thank you. faithlessness, God loves us still and waits in mercy to forgive. 
trust in the promises given at our baptism, let us confess our sin before God and one another, first in unison and then in the silence of our hearts. Please join me in our union, unison prayer of confession as found in the bulletin. Holy God, you promise us a life full of blessing, but we do not always believe. You incite us to hope, but we fall back into fear. You urge us to give freely, but we cling to what we have. You call us to watch at all times for you, but we grow lazy and self-absorbed. Forgive us, increase our hope, enlarge our hearts, and keep us alert to the wonders you work in the world every day. For the sake of Jesus, we, we pray. Hear the good news. By faith we have been saved, our guilt, guilty hearts washed clean, refreshed, revived, and renewed, empowered by the Holy Spirit, live as ones who are forgiven and freed, giving thanks to God. Friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand as you are able, or body or spirit, to join in the Gloria Patri. to our deepest core that in Christ we are made new, we are forgiven, we are washed clean. And with this knowledge we can find true peace. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Please greet one another with a sign of Christ's peace. Peace be with you. Peace. I do want to say I love all the shades of green as we greet one another. Come on down, not to The Price is Right, but to Pastor Catherine. Do you only know what the show The Price is Right is? Maybe if you're sick, you might watch it on TV, because it's during the day. It's a game show where people guess prices to win things. So, as we've been doing throughout Lent, I'm going to be telling us a paraphrase of one of the readings from the Gospel of John. Y'all ready to hear it? Jesus was in Bethany on his way to Jerusalem with his disciples to celebrate Passover. They stopped at the home of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, his good friends. They were giving a dinner for Jesus. Martha had cooked all day and was putting the food on the table. Lazarus was sitting with Jesus and the disciples. Then... Mary did something very unusual. She brought out a jar of nard, which is expensive oil with a wonderful smell. So it smells very good. Nard was one of the oils used to prepare dead bodies for burial. But Mary poured it on Jesus' feet. Then she wiped his feet with her hair. The scent of the nard filled the whole room, and it drew attention to Mary and what she was doing. Judas... The disciple who took care of the money for Jesus and the disciples said, Why was this nard not sold for lots of money to be, that could be given to the poor? Mary shrank back a bit. Had she done something wrong? Was Jesus unhappy with her? 
Leave her alone, Jesus said. She bought this star so she could have it to bury me. The poor will be with you long after I am gone. The delicious meal Martha had prepared continued. Mary knew that she had done a good thing for Jesus. But I wonder how Judas felt. Do you know who Judas is? He's the one who ends up betraying Jesus, who, who then, he's the one who said, gives him to be arrested. That's who Judas is, one of the 12 disciples. So we can start to see there's some conflict there, right? There's like some differences of opinion between Jesus and Judas as we gear towards uh, less than two weeks. Because Good Friday's in less than two weeks, which is pretty soon. With this in mind, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Want to pray with me? Dear God, we thank you that you care so much for us. Help us to care for one another, the world, and you, just as you care for us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay, thank you. And I would love to invite the choir forward. If you're going to go play with my daughter, have fun. Are we going to...
Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. Please join me in our prayer for illumination as found in the, your bulletin. Speak to us, O Lord, your saving word. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and feed us with the bread of life. In and through Christ we pray. Amen. Our first reading this morning is 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 16, found on page 282 in your pew Bibles. Please listen to the word. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go now to Seraphith, which belongs to Sidon, and live there. For I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel so that I may drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterwards, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day of, that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she as well as he and her household ate for many days. The jar of meal was not emptied, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Let us listen to what the Spirit is saying to us as a church today. Oh, this is on page 874 of the Pew Bible. And John has some things in parentheses today. And so if you want to follow along, it'd probably be very helpful to see what is parenthetical and what is not. Without me having to say, you know, clunky with the parentheses. Okay, with that in mind, let us see what the Spirit is saying to us, the church, today. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. God, it is in your abundant love and mercy that we gather together today. May we all, as we go through this time of preaching, feel you guide us and show us the way for how we move forward this day and every day. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today on our sermon series on the gifts of Christ, 
gifts of Christ is all about abundance. How God provides so much for us. The very interesting thing is, the example of abundance from the Gospel of John isn't about Jesus giving something away in abundance, but about someone treating Jesus with an overabundance of perfumed oil. And yet, I stand by the fact that this is about Jesus' gift of abundance. I just wanted to make that very clear from the beginning, that at first glance, the abundance in this packet, passage is from Mary to Jesus and not the other way around. Just so we're all clear, I see that too. Now, abundance is something I don't spend a lot of time thinking about, but is a reality for those of us in this room. Now, I know people are struggling. I'm guessing some of you are struggling, or if you're not, you know someone who is. And yet the reality is we live in a culture of abundance. We're steeped in a world that having more means you're safe. Buying X, Y, or Z will bring you joy and will take away those negative feelings for maybe an hour or two. Our culture is wrapped around buying more and more and more. Many of us have an overabundance of just stuff in our lives, and that can be to our own detriment. Late last week, another pastor told me of someone in their congregation who is struggling financially. And this person isn't sure how they're going to make it through the rest of the month. And the payment on their three storage containers just maxed out their credit cards. And this is a scary, horrible position to be in. And yet I'm certain this person isn't alone in this predicament. There are more people out there in this situation in our country than I'd really like to think about. Perhaps their situation resonates with yours, either now or in the past. This person wasn't sure how they'd buy food and gas for the rest of the month, and they had so many things that they needed to rent three storage units, and one of them hadn't been opened in years. We, as a culture overall, have an abundance of stuff. I'm guilty as charged too, especially with a baby now. I want to buy her all of the things that'll be helpful for her development, have her have some fun and joy. And yet her favorite toys tend to be <clears throat> serving spoons, any of our utensils, especially knives and forks, empty canisters that she can play with like a drum, magnets, especially that she pulls off the fridge, switches of any sort, but especially the lighted switches on surge protectors. Those are her favorite toys at the moment. She doesn't need any of the stuff I've already accumulated for her. Does she enjoy her toys and the various gear? Yes, she does. But she's just as happy with the things that were already in the house before she arrived. And yet with her birthday coming up, there's even more things that I want or hope for her to have. Right? There's a never-ending list of things. So the real question for me becomes, does the thing that I have an abundance or overabundance of remove me from my connection with God? Am I spending more time thinking about the clutter around my home than I am in prayer? Am I focused more on, say, my retirement accounts than I am on reading the Bible? Am I more worried about someone will think of me if I don't have a nice car or the right type of clothes or some other social marker that I'm doing well than about how God is thinking about my behavior? Abundance in our sermon today isn't about keeping up with the Joneses. It isn't about making more money or having a stockpile of food for you and your family to last six months in the basement. It's about living life knowing that life itself is an abundant gift. The widow from Zarephath, not New Jersey, but Sidon, knew about the gift of life and what can happen when it's taken away. 
Her husband had died, and with him, all respectable ways for the woman and her son to survive died too. She tells Elijah in verse 12 of our passage from 1 Kings that as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. She fully expects this to be her last meal for herself and her son, and then they will starve. She can only see the scarcity in her life rather than any form of abundance. I can't even imagine the stress and sorrow that must be present in her life to think this is the only thing possible for her and her son. Now, the thing is, it's not just that she's a widow that makes this hard. There's also been a drought in the greater region for some time. Sidon isn't a land, is not in the land of Israel, but it's a neighboring community, a neighboring people group. Incidentally, Sidon is also where Jezebel is from. And Queen Jezebel, along with her husband, King Ahab of Israel, are Elijah's biggest foes in 1 Kings. And this drought was caused by Elijah in his battle against Ahab and Jezebel's idol worship. They worship Baal, if you're interested. This confrontation is what caused Elijah to flee Israel in the first place. And now God has brought him to the land of Jezebel. And in this land, there Elijah finds hospitality. This woman who has literally nothing left is willing to believe this stranger, this wild man, and brings him a small cake before she feeds herself and her son what she thinks will be their last meal. And instead, a miracle occurs. God makes sure that that jar and that jug will not be empty. It's not as though they're always made full. That's a different story. It's that they won't become empty. In this time of feeling unsupported, fully alone, this widow and her son are taken care of by God through their hospitality to Elijah. God gave them an abundant gift, the gift of food to sustain their bodies and the gift of hope. Amid the mother's despair and their grief over losing their primary provider, God provides them with hope. Hope that things won't always be so bad. Hope that people do care. Hope that even a stranger can provide for their needs. Hope that hospitality does pay off. And we see this hope in hospitality in our passage from John as well. About a week before the Passover, which means less than a week before Jesus will be leading into Jerusalem, I'm sorry, heading into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, Jesus goes to his friend's house. This is where Lazarus, Martha, and Mary all live. And while there, while eating dinner, Mary does something above and beyond. She not only cleans Jesus' feet, she uses a pound of expensive oil, nard, to also anoint his feet. This takes hospitality and magnifies it a hundredfold. Now, it was very common for guests to someone's house to have their feet washed as they entered by a servant or a member of the family, depending on the family's status, as, as part of welcoming them to this home. Remember, Back in that time, everyone basically walked everywhere, right? And the roads were just compacted dirt. Sanitation wasn't like it is today. There wasn't indoor plumbing, which meant that feet would get quite dirty all the time. And so when you enter someone's house, it would be customary to wash your feet or rather to have your feet be washed 
So this means Mary washing Jesus' feet isn't that odd. It's the magnitude with which she does it that shows her hope in hospitality. Because Mary had been paying attention to what Jesus had been saying during his ministry, as well as the growing unease that the Pharisees have about him. And so she's likely put together that things are going to be even more intense than normal. And so she does something outrageous. She anoints his feet with way more oil than is needed for feet. John tells us the only person to object vocally is Judas Iscariot because he wanted the money for the group's purse rather than for Jesus. So what can we learn from Mary's gift of abundance? We can learn that sometimes going over the top with what you give is doing just the right thing. Jesus responds to her and to Judas' remark by saying, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Times are coming, Jesus is saying, when this gift won't be able to be used. She's doing what she feels and knows to be the best use of this extravagant nard, this abundant gift, and she shows that she's a disciple, a true disciple of Jesus, unlike Judas, who is called a disciple and fails to live into the calling rather remarkably. It's in Jesus that Mary gets this sense of abundance, so much so that she shares from her abundance with him. And she personally knows that Jesus is a source of abundance with the fact that in just the chapter before, just past this past Sunday, Jesus raised his, her brother Lazarus from the dead. Could there be a better gift than that? To have a loved one you thought was gone forever to be returned to you? I really doubt it. Jesus gave her the abundant gift of life and love, and she gave abundantly as a response. Of course, Christ's abundant gifts don't end with the raising of Lazarus, one of the most remarkable signs of Jesus' power in the Gospel of John. Another more widespread, wide-reaching gift of abundance is still to come. We've yet to traverse the road into Jerusalem. Jesus hasn't gone to a fake trial and been found guilty yet. He hasn't died on the cross, the ultimate death of humiliation, or been buried and silent for an entire day. He hasn't risen from the grave yet. Yet we know this is coming. John is pointing to this fact that this is coming from the very first verse that we read today six days before the Passover. These things are coming, and they're coming quickly. Christ's gift of abundant life on how we've been saved and transformed and given new life through him is coming quickly. Lent is a time when we think deeply about this truth, that Jesus, the Son of God, came into this world to live teach, heal, and change the way everything is. He came to begin the total transformation of this world into the new kingdom of God. And this transformation is still in progress. We're still waiting to see this come into full fruition. Christ gave us the abundant gift of new life. And we're called to live into this gift, to share this gift, to support others in their journeys of faith, to also embrace this gift of life. I say it almost every week during our words of reconciliation, also called assurance of pardon, that in Christ we're made a new creation. Our old lives are gone and our new lives have begun. That is the gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, given to us in an abundance. We see various examples in the Gospels, and we trust it within our own lives. For we see the ways we've been abundantly blessed by God, especially when we open our hearts, our eyes, our minds to what God is doing in, through, and around us. 
And just like Mary, just like the widow in Zarephath, we're not meant to keep our abundance to ourselves. We're called to share, to give, to hold our hands open loosely with whatever we do have in abundance. We all have abundance in different places. Perhaps yours is time. Perhaps yours is knowledge. Perhaps yours is a specific skill. Perhaps yours is faith. God has given us outlets and ways of blessing others, blessing this world. And it's part of our callings as Christians to delve into how we can share our abundance with others. It might not be clear right this second what you have in abundance. God will help you to see what it is when you place your full trust and attention to God, on God. The Holy Spirit is always with you to guide your steps. So friends, trust that Christ has given you an abundance of something. And now, as his hands and feet in this world, you can give out of that abundance to someone else who needs it. Amen. Please stand as you are able in body or spirit to join in our congregational song. Lord, I need you. standing as you are able in body and spirit and repeat it with me the affirmation of faith the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord 
who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we share our joys and concerns, after which we respond, God of mercy, hear our prayer. Is there anyone in the congregation that has a joy or a concern? Paulette? God of mercy, hear our prayer. Anyone else? Oh, Janet, Charlie. Oh, you don't have, it's not working, I guess. I will repeat them. So Paulette asked for prayers for her daughter-in-law, Kristen, who lost her dad. And now Janet. God of mercy, mercy hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Janet wanted to give her thanks and for the support that she's got from her church family during the time of her illness. And she is feeling a little bit better, and we're glad that she's able to be with us today. Sheila? Uh, just prayers for this Friday. I go to the doctor for some test results. So just some prayers that we have some good news. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Anybody else? Tom? Um, just want to say thank you to everyone uh, that offered their condolences to me for my father. Um, got several cards from church members, so it was very nice to, to see and, and to, uh, to get. So thank you again from everyone from our family. Um, and also, uh, this Wednesday is Sharon and I's 25th wedding anniversary. So two joys. God of mercy, there, hear our yes. prayer. Anybody else in the congregation? Anybody on Zoom, Walter? I have one, if Betty. Um, Betty Martin is in the hospital, and she's in isolation, so prayers for Betty. At least she was on Friday. It didn't sound like she was likely getting out of isolation anytime soon, so prayers for Betty. God of mercy, God of mercy hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Is there anybody else, Walter, or is that? No. Okay. Uh, I've got one, Penny. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we've got another turmoil in this country. It's Haiti, and I'm praying for all of the people there that some type of political uh, involvement will occur to be able to settle that country down. Our country specifically, however. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Where's that, everybody? Okay. Having shared these with one another, please join with me in prayer. Loving God, we come to you in times of need and in times of plenty. Help us to always see the ways you've blessed us with an abundance and help us to open, to be open with how we're called to also give abundantly as a joyful response to the ways you've given to us. We pray, O oh God, for your church around the world. May all your followers be united in our service of you and this world you created. May we see the ways you're calling us to be your hands and feet wherever we find ourselves and help the whole church to live into your calling. We pray, O oh God, for this country, for our leaders, our citizens, and those who hope to join us. May we focus on our principles and our hopes rather than on egos and divisions. Guide us all, O oh God, to create a better country together than the one we've been living in recently. 
We pray, O oh God, for this church community. Help us to be the light on the hill, the church that helps to bring peace and comfort and joy to our neighbors. Show us the ways you're calling us to serve and to be servants of our Lord and Savior. O oh God, we pray for the people you've placed on our hearts. We know you're always with them, and we ask that you help us to be there with them too. We also pray for them too. And so we pray for Kristen and for Sheila as she waits for Friday for those results. We pray for Betty. And we pray for the people in Haiti, oh God. May they find some political stillness rather than political chaos. And God, we also pray for those moments of joy that are amongst us. And so we lift up the support this community was able to give to Janet during this time of her illness. And we thank you that she's starting to feel better. And we thank you that this community was able to support Tom and that he and his family were able to feel the care that so many people have for him after losing his dad. And we also thank you that he has Wednesday and to look forward to where, when they will share their 25th wedding anniversary. What a milestone that is. We pray, O oh God, for the children of this world. We don't know what things will look like as they continue to age and grow. And so we pray for their spiritual and emotional maturity to grow and strengthen their ties to you, their loving creator. We thank you, O oh God, for so many gifts, especially for the Lord's Prayer, which we will now pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite Richard forward. Oh, and he has two fish banks with him. Surprise! Well, on the first Sunday in March, uh, I was supposed to present to you the uh, idea of having everyone having fish banks instead of, instead of having the one great hour of sharing, and I wasn't there, but Pastor did a great job with the Sunday school kids to do that. So we, have, we had our bank at home, and it was sitting in the, on the table in the kitchen, and I walked by the other day, and I, I went like this, and I didn't, I didn't hear anything, you know. So... Uh, I felt bad about that, and, and in about a week, with all the change I had in my pocket, instead of putting it in the Poland Springs bottle that I have next to my bed uh, to collect change, I put it in here. And it sounds pretty good. Okay, so if, I hope you got yours, and I hope... There's more. Yeah, there's, there's some in the back. This is like in addition to the envelope that you, you have in your bulletin and the explanation of what the one great hour of sharing is for. But it's kind of neat to just get that change in your pocket out of there, put it in the bank, and uh, the kids don't know it yet, but they're going to be counting the money one of these days in, in Sunday school class. So with that, um, I'm, the repairing of the breach is the theme for the one great hour of sharing. And it's basically our opportunity to give mission uh, for our church through the Presbyterian one great hour of sharing. We can't get out and build houses. We can't go out to different countries. But this is our opportunity where 100% of anything that we give can help. It's better than an empty fish. <laughs> empty fish. So uh, with that, you can read about it in your bulletin and let us pray. Help us to delight in you, O oh God, that we might become agents of healing and hope, repair and restoration, transform our brokenness and fear into justice and mercy, and bless our work to share your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I'm gonna, I'll put, well, 
I'll put this empty one up there if anyone lost theirs or uh, the fish got away or whatever. You can grab it. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. And good job building those banks. <laughs> so friends, God calls us to share what we have, a little bread, a little water, and God uses those simple gifts to bring abundant blessing to the world. Dedication. Thanks and praise to you, O God, 
By your grace, you bring the dead to life. Let us use the breath you have given us to speak your truth and sing your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, now it's time for announcements. The one that I kept forgetting to make, but needs to be made, is on Easter Sunday after church, we're having an Easter egg hunt for all of the, the kids. And that means we would love some candy. So if you could please get some candy and drop it off so we can stuff those eggs for Easter Sunday, now that it's only two Sundays away. <laughs> and so that is an announcement I was meaning to make a few weeks ago and just haven't. So there we go. I've made it. Thank you for bringing candy. Thank you. I also have something. Presbyterian women are going to meet this Thursday at 9.30 in Fellowship Hall. All are welcomed, and we would love to see you there. Um, we'll be discussing our, year, our plans for the, next, for the next year. Please plan to come. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Joanne. Ooh, I see a basket. Oh. Who will it be? Who will it be on this St. Patrick's Day? I bet it's themed. <laughs> Linda DeGroat. Thank you, Joanne, for that plug for the discussion group. It is the last week, so things are wrapping up in Lent. But yes. Yeah, and, you don't have to go to all of them to just show up. Yeah. Any other announcements? Okay, hearing none, I just want to say happy St. Patrick's Day. My mom and I have a little feast for everybody that may or may not be to theme. You can make that decision to yourselves. And so let us. Join together in our closing hymn, number 466, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. memorized that's what you get from the Irish blessing today. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.
Lois, did you notice that um, when the camera went around the sanctuary, it just showed the tops of the, uh, of the windows and the ceiling? It didn't show any people. It went around three or four times. I was going to tell them that, but I don't know where.